fashion show from experience to encounter. In life, some people have been bent but not broken. Some are crushed but not defeated. That is what you're going to be seeing on Ball Foundation Show today. My name is Omolara Ayola PMH. And you're welcome to War Foundation Show, where you get to give a voice to your testimony. And you get to share your story from experience to encounter. My guest on the show today is someone that can be termed bent but not broken, crushed but not defeated. You want to know why? You just sit back and enjoy the show. We'll be right back. You're welcome back. You're still tuned in on to War Foundation Show. And if you're just joining us, I said earlier on that my guest in the house today is someone we can describe as bent but not broken, crushed but not defeated. I have my guest right here with me in the house. Please welcome with me Ayomide Franks. Thank you very much. You're welcome on the show. Thank you. We're so glad to have you. So here. Yeah. I've heard a lot about you and I'm so glad to meet you today. Uh -huh. I hope we heard good things. <laughs> Fantastic things actually. And I'm sure that the viewers are going to hear many more things from you today okay according to the little things i heard about your story i know that it's a very touching one and i'm sure that you're going to do us you know that opportunity of hearing the details today okay so what is your story uh, like she said my name is Ayamide franks and um i grew up um on the mainland what the formal den Morocco, which is mm -hmm. now I think Victoria next now. Um, I attended Asarudin Primary School one, and then I proceeded to Kramo College, all on, on the island, the Bushery, before we moved down to Zimbabwe. Now, I actually grew up not to know who my real parents were, and. Well, the, the family I actually grew up to know, I accepted and all of that. And then I loved this family real good. I think my story started at early mid 80s, I can't remember now, but I think I was like six, seven when my story started. And you know, then. We were attending Deeper Life Bible Church. And the man I grew up to know as my father was working with Plateau State Lazin Office then. And then um, he happened to be an house fellowship leader. You know. We were living in a room apartment. We had a couch and we had two beds and every other stuff. You know, I had I had a bed to myself. When I when I realized um, or when I came to know about my abuse was, you know, at night, in the night, he would crawl into my bed and touch me, you know, because I, I love sleep as a child. <laughs> I would. A lot of children love to sleep, actually. Yeah, mm. I, would, I would sleep, you know. And at a point, he started fingering me. I never knew. You know, I never knew what it was. You know, as I was growing, I remember I used to be very vibrant. I was full of life. I was so playful. And at the same time, I was brilliant. And so, you know, my abuse continued. He would crawl into my bed at night when I'm fast asleep. He would figure me, he would do all sorts and all that. You know, he would do it in a way that I, I, I don't know. But, you know, I never knew what it was. I didn't know it was bad. In those days, you, you know, mm. no, no one to know. tell you if you're actually doing something like, bad. Exactly. It wasn't like now you, you educate your child. Yes. You tell yes. them you don't go close to this person. You don't allow this person to put yeah. you on your lap. You don't, mm. you know, a whole lot of things then. You don't, you don't know. And, you, you know, those, those years, what, what a five-year-old will do now a ten-year-old couldn't do it back then, yeah. you know, and so it continued. Primary school to secondary school and all of that, and all of that, and all of that. I can't really say this was when 
a style presentation. I was not able to flaunt my virginity as a child, as a girl child, growing up. And I think I don't even know what it means to, to, to be, be a virgin. virgin. I just knew I was a child. I just knew I had I have a vagina and I grew up I grew up in the midst of boys anyway, who were not even related to me in any way. You know? And um I realized that I had interest in girls rather than boys. But I, I grew up in the midst of boys, I was doing everything the boys were doing. Mm. But I wasn't sleeping with a girl, you know. I said I, I, I do everything a boy does because I play football. You can't, you can't catch me playing tente. <laughs> you never will. No, no, no. I was even, I was being forced to wear skirts. Mm. I never loved anything feminine. You oh. can't catch me on a blouse. <laughs> nah, nah. In fact, sometimes when I'm going to work, you see me put buttoning my shirt and talking in on the road. <laughs> I don't, no, 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 you know. And I was growing up like that a lot of my life. I was okay, I was fine. Until when Colonel Raji Asaki demolished Morocco. And by that time, he was working with the American Embassy as one of their security personnel. So we had to move to Ikoi, Queen's Drive, precisely. And um, we were given an apartment. And so I had to go to school from Queen's Drive. I had to cross the water to Uzumba Madue, Victoria Island. We were staying at Ikoi. So while I was growing up, I realized that he was growing to, I, I don't know how to say that, but I think he was growing to be liking my body and wanting mm. to do stuff like he was wanting to do an experiment wow. with my body. Like taking everything he's been doing with your body to another level. Exactly. So at a point, we were in the house at night, we were actually watching a horror movie. All of a sudden, I said, I just told everyone, I need to go and pee. So when I stood up, the house, you go out through the door, and you turn this way to get to the toilet. So when I got to the toilet, I eased myself. So I, as I was trying to come out, I just came out and I saw someone by the door. Mm -hmm. And I stood still. I was just looking at him. The next thing I saw, he just took out his tongue and did it in a very funny but annoying way. When he did that, I just looked down and walked past him. I went in. You know, the, the, the floor was tiled and I loved the coolness of the floor. So I went in, I laid down after everybody must have gone to sleep. So he came in and said, why are you lying on the cold floor? I said, I, I like it. He said, you catch pneumonia. I said, I like it. He said, I don't think you understand what pneumonia is. I said, I like that pneumonia. I want it. <laughs> he said, okay. He left. You know, he was always trying to come to me at night to abuse me and all of that. So at a point, they had to move to the mainland. So when they moved, I actually moved with them, initially. Um, when we got to the mainland, they settled and I had to go back to school. I was given a very small but comfortable room to me. The room was comfortable because it was just me, my clothes, my school bag and all. You know? So I had to go back to the island. I was schooling, I was doing fine, so I thought, okay, I think I was doing well still, you know. He had to be coming to work from the mainland to Ikoi. And sometimes when he comes like that at night, he comes and takes advantage of me when I am fast asleep. Because my door is not always locked. locked. You know, and he would do it at a time nobody would see him. You know, he continued like that. He would finger me sometimes when he come in. He would do all sorts. And when I want to scream, he would tell me, if you scream, I will kill you. 
-hmm. And you know, as a child, I was, I don't know anything about, and I was scared of dying. Mm -hmm. I don't want to die, you know. And when he's done, he will leave. I said, don't tell anybody. I'll keep quiet. So at a point, I felt sick. He was not on duty. I felt sick. No, before I felt sick, he came one night and then um, I think he was knocking at my door. That day I just decided, let me lock this door. Anyhow, anyway, I'm going to lock this door. So when he came, he knocked. I didn't open. He called my name a few times. I didn't respond. I was just lying there. He knocked again and called my name. I said, let me in. I said, no. You are not coming in this night. If you want to kill me <laughs> in the morning, just kill me. Let me die. Hmm. You know, he got angry and walked away. I slept. Before I woke up to dress for school, he had gone. So we, he left. But later on, I felt sick. He was not around. I felt sick. I just started feeling feverish and um, I was just sitting outside. One of the domestic staff saw me and said, what is wrong with you? And I said, I don't know. I just know I'm not fine. And I was sitting under the sun. The man said, leave the sun. I said, no, sir. I'm actually enjoying the sun. Mm. So at the point, he forced me to leave the sun. I sat where he asked me to sit. He felt my temperature and said, ah, you're sick. And I was shivering. So he gave me dagger. I know that time dagger, that guy is very bitter. <laughs> and I hated drugs. I can't imagine. <laughs> oh no. I hated drugs. Even now, I still hate drugs. Mm. If I'm sick, just give me an injection and I'll be fine. I mm. hated drugs. So when he handed the dagger to me, I said, I can't take it, sir. I said, just try. When I looked at the dagger. And I looked at how much they're making me. He said, just try. He gave me food. I was, I couldn't eat, but somehow I managed and I took the dagger, I slept. So when he came, I think I was in my room. The man told him that I wasn't feeling well. So he said, okay, that he will take me to the mainland. If I knew that going to the mainland was going to be the beginning of my nightmares and my traumas, I would have insisted I die on the, main, on the island. Hmm. Because when I was taken to the mainland for treatment, I was treated. When I got home, I was told, they called in a family doctor. Then the man came, ran some tests and said, I had pneumonia. Everybody was scared in the house. Pneumonia. And you know, I could hardly, I can't talk to you like this. I have to hold my side and I'll bend to talk for you to hear. Even if you are you are even if you are close to entering my mouth, mm. I'll have to bend for you to hear what I'm going to say. Mm. When everybody was scared in the house, mommy was scared. She was she would be like, "What are you going to eat?" Because I wasn't eating. What will you eat? I'll tell her what I want to eat. She will go prepare the food. By the time the food is ready, I won't be able to eat. Mm. What cost that pneumonia was when I was on the island? On the island you know. There is this lady that sells cold drink very close to the house. I'll go meet her in the afternoon and tell her, babe, when you're going, eh, those block, <laughs> keep them for me. Okay, so I'll go pick the block, chew in the middle of the night to keep me awake. So at a point, I felt sick and I was taken back to the mainland. If I had known that, Going to the mainland to join the whole family was going to be the beginning of my traumas and my nightmares. I would have stayed back. I would have refused bluntly to stay on the island. So after my treatment, after I got well, I went back to school. I don't know for how long, but at the point he told me, I don't have money for tea fair, for you to be, be going to the island and coming back and all of that. So I had to stay. I spent a whole year in the house not going anywhere. But I think I remember that I worked with somebody as a sales girl, just not to be idle. And a few times I picked up books and I read. So eventually I was enrolled in a secondary school 
in Ojodo. So while in that secondary school, I met Mrs. Yemida Berry. I was doing well in that school. I also remembered my English teacher then, walking up to me, telling me he wanted a relationship with me. I looked up I looked at him and I said, sir, you are my teacher, besides you're married, and I, I can't possibly date you. You know, it went like that. So when my traumas actually began, nobody knew. In fact, Yemi, who was very close, never knew what was happening to me. At the point I became withdrawn, I became so quiet. I became this girl that sometimes when you talk, I'll just, I'll just be looking. But you never know, there are a whole lot going on in, the mind. in my mind, in my head. So sometimes I dread the night. I don't even want the night time to come because I know what was going to happen. Even though he had not had penetration then, I remembered I can remember the faces he makes at me. I can remember the advances. I can remember a whole lot. You know, the first time he had penetration, we were all sleeping. Everybody was sleeping. You know, and he just crawled up the way I was lying. And I just started feeling. And I was like, what is this? What? What is this? And I heard him telling me, keep quiet. Don't say a word and stuff, you know, when he was going to penetrate, it was painful and I made to scream and he held my mouth. So I couldn't shout. So when he was done, he left me there. I was in pain. I couldn't cry in the morning. I couldn't talk to nobody. I was just there and I was just managing myself, going to school, trying to concentrate on my studies, trying to get the pins and the pictures off my head. And all the her mother was she in was the there. Room, even the night she, she was, penetrated. She was there. She was there. You know? And it continued like that. Many times he would rape me. And you know, the people I saw like big brothers in the neighborhood. Like as if there was a communication between him and them. I was just called upon one time like that. One of the guys I was looking up to as a big brother called me and asked me to run an errand for him. It was in the evening and I said, okay, what do you want me to do for you? He said, go buy me this. And I went. By the time I came in, I was surprised. I, it never crossed my mind that something was going to happen. I just saw like three guys in the room. So I gave him I was actually standing by the door. I stretched my hand. He said, come in. I said, no, I had to go back to the house because mother will be looking for me. He said, no, come in, you're safe. And I just went in. The moment I stepped into the room, one of the guys locked the door. And I was gangrene that night. Wow. By the time they were done, I managed to walk back to the house. So when I got back to the house, I just saw my mother in the passage. Where are you coming from? I said I went to the toilet. She said, you liar and all that. Before I knew what was happening, the cloth I was putting on, she just and tore my pants. Well, she dipped her hand she dipped her under hand your skirt and pulled my pants and tore it. And I was embarrassed. I was like, you know, I didn't want to tell her what happened. Mm -hmm. The next thing I heard, she said, and all of that and all of that. I didn't do anything. You know, I was just trying to... Yeah. How old were you then? I think I wasn't even 20 then. I think I was in my, in my teenage years, you know. And it continued like that. So I remember one afternoon. I think that was the afternoon. He actually pinned me to the bed. I don't know where I was coming from. I can't remember what happened that day. I just knew I walked into the house and the moment I entered, I saw his funny face. And by the time I saw that funny face, I knew something was going to happen. So I made to walk out of the door. Before I turned, he was already by the door. He just locked the door and said, if you love your life, don't shout. 
Just let me do what I want to do. And I was like, you can't possibly be doing this. But you called yourself my father. The next thing I knew, pushed me to the bed, pinned me and raped me that afternoon. Can you remember what he used to pin you then? I think he tied, if I remember vividly, I think he tied my hands to the bed. So I, I can't fight and, and stuff. And then, I can't even remember what he did to my legs. But I knew he, he raped me that afternoon. And when he was done, he smiled and, and told me every father does that to their daughters. Wow. And when he said that, I was like, so, Mr. Larry, why did he do that to his daughter, Kemi? Is that it? Is that what he's saying? Every father does this. Thing. I just walked away. I went to sit down and I was like, what kind of life is this? God, why? Why do a man I called father for so many years do this to me? You know, I couldn't get an answer. I couldn't even talk to mother about it. I couldn't tell anybody what was happening. Were there other siblings in the house? Of the course. Mm -hmm. Of course. Of course they were. And so it continued like that and stuff. You know, we had a neighbor too who, who was macho, big. One afternoon too, he saw me. He called me and said, OK, I need you to help me get something. By the time I came in, I gave him. He just locked the door and I was like, ah, is it that there is a communication between all, of, this all of these people? What is the problem? And then he had me that afternoon. I never knew, father knew what was happening. So by the time the guy was done, he just opened the door and said, get the hell out. And I told him and I looked at him. He just said, get out. He pushed me. So I stumbled out. And I saw my father. He now smiled at me very wickedly and said, What was in here, Bobo? Here. A minute of her she. What's wrong with this man? Have you not had enough? He said, What that guy did to you now, I want to have. A taste of it. If you don't allow me, I will tell the whole neighbors that I'll be sleeping around with our neighbor. Ah! I said, God. I just gave him. And he had his way that afternoon. When he was done, he smiled at me. He said, Don't ever tell anybody or else you die. You know, they are always coming up with this. If you tell anybody, you will die. Mm. Okay, so all the while that he was threatening to tell the neighbors that um, you've been sleeping around with other men, it didn't occur to you that you could also expose him? Not at all. Not at all. I never had a slight idea that I could expose him. Even if I had wanted to expose him, who do I tell? Mm. And who would believe? Mm. Everybody will like it's a lie, you're lying and stuff. And I never had the, the, the thing is I never had a good relationship with both of them. I was not close to any of them. Mm -hmm. But I just loved him, you know, because he was brilliant. I was looking up to him as a father, like someone who would protect me. But reverse was the case. Especially if they had punished you a few times and even neighbors feel that you are the bad child. Exactly. You know, I never had a, I was not even close to both of them to start with. I wasn't close to mother. She was short tempered. I wasn't close to her and all of that. I was this, I was just me, you know. And it never even occurred to me to say anything to anybody. Because at the point I was like, who do I tell that? My father was, was sleeping happy. with me. Who would believe me? How do I cope? If they send me out of the house, where do I go? Mm. You know? But the day the, the, the day mother found out, oh my goodness. I don't even know how what happened. And she knew. So she was going to scream. I think I remember she 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 just woke up 
and then found him on top of me. Hmm. And she was like, what? What is this? Abomination and all of that and that. So when he stood up, she was going to shout. It was in the middle of the night. He said, no, please don't shout. Don't let the whole neighborhood know what is happening. Please. And then she looked at me and said, you did so you have been sleeping with your father. Turned it on you. And I was like, ah, how is it my fault? What have I done? And I was and she was saying all stuff. And then the next thing I heard on my face was a heavy slap. Pow! Can you daffle? Can you come? And all of that. And I was just looking. I couldn't sleep. Both of them went to bed. I don't know if they if they were able to sleep, but I couldn't sleep. After she found out, I couldn't just sleep because I was I was now wondering. This man had done a whole damage to me. Now his wife has found out. And where do I go? In the morning, he went to work, and um, I think she told me to take lunch. He had stopped working with the U.S. embassy. So I took lunch and went. You know, while she was preparing the lunch, she now brought up the topic and she was like, your father was sleeping with you and you couldn't tell me, you couldn't talk, you didn't say anything and, and all that. I said, he said I should not talk. And she was like, you are stupid. Why can't you talk? And stuff. She was just saying all manner of things. And by the time she was done, I took the food to him. It was not easy for me to locate where he was working, but eventually I took the food to him and I went back home. I lost concentration in class. I just, all of a sudden, I just realized that when my teacher was teaching, I would be in class and the next thing, I wasn't there again. Hmm. I'll be looking at my teacher, but I won't hear what he, he or she is saying. You know, I was just there and at a point I, I realized my grades, everything started dropping. Okay, so um, um, I heard about a pregnancy. What led to that pregnancy? At what point did you get pregnant? Okay. I got pregnant when I got involved with a man I thought, uh, of course I didn't know what love was, but I, I felt I loved the guy. I just liked him and I felt, okay, this was love. And I got involved. Both of us got involved. I think I felt my body has been trained to have sex. Yeah. I don't walk on the street and see a guy who tells me, oh, I like you. The next thing in my mind will be sex. sex. Mm. I don't see a guy that touches me. The next thing on my mind is sex. I don't see a guy who tells me, oh, I like your body structure. The next thing on my mind is sex. So any nice person just tells you sex. Anything sex. You know, I just felt I liked this guy, and that was all. I slept with him, and I realized I, I missed my period. The next thing, I got pregnant, and I didn't tell anybody. They, they don't even know the father of my first child, CEO, when they died, because I didn't tell them. And I had to carry the pregnancy. I was in their house. I went through hell. You know, at a point... Who died? The two parents? The two parents. Wow. At a point... I just woke up one day and, you know, I picked a few of my things. Then I was, I, just, I got a job with um, a poetry, a poetry um, job. I got a poetry job. I was um, attending to pigs, you know. I just picked a few of my things. Mother was not around. I picked, picked a few of my things and I told him. I said, well, I'm going to work. I might not come back. And he looked at me and said, where would you be going? Mm. I said, wherever. Anywhere. But if you don't see me, don't find me. Of course, he knew where I was working. So I said, if you don't see me, don't look for me. He said, okay, what if your mother comes back? What should I tell her I left the house? I'm no longer wanted in this house. So I'm gone. He said, no. I said, tell him, okay, tell her I will do, I'll be washing in my place of work and I'll be coming late. I picked few of my things. Actually, I wanted to, I was going to leave the house. I picked 
big film. I think I was eight months gone or so. Hmm. My friends, and she nobody, didn't know still. She, no, she, she, she knew I got pregnant. Okay. You know, the day she knew father was sleeping with me, she screamed and all of that. And, you know, all the drama, they begged her not to make noise. And so the, the next morning, I, two days, three days into her, I think, I was just going to fetch water. And I met somebody I knew from Kuramo College. The elder brother attended Methodist Boys High. Myself and the lady went to Kuramo College. I just met her with some of her family members and a friend of hers. And I was going to say, blessing, how hey, you did? The next thing, she just turned and looked at me and said, you are your party. Gosh. I just stood there. And I was looking at them. And I felt the ground should open and swallow me on the spot. You know, I was surprised. Hey, how did this girl take me with they happen? Okay, so in all of these experiences, how did you encounter Christ? Okay. Well, we were attending Deeper Life at the time all of this was happening. And, when and your parents who were Deeper Lifers? Yes. You know, when they, when, when they got to know I was pregnant, and when they got to know he was sleeping with me, both of us were excommunicated from the church. So I, somehow, a friend of mine invited me to church, RCCG, and I attended. When I attended, I think that was January 11 or something, 2008, if I'm correct now. I went, you know, and um, it was difficult for me initially because at a point I was like, God, can you ever accept somebody who had been messed up like me? Someone who had gone through a lot and someone who is not even ready to forgive the person who had killed me times over and over before I die. Mm. Can you accept someone like me who has a lot of bitterness against somebody? Can you ever look at me and say, this is my daughter? Can you say, oh, I'm proud of you? And the whole of was going in my mind and I was like, how was I going to, how was I going to walk up to God and tell him, me and all of that but somehow you know I somehow I don't know how it happened I just knew that I was able to talk to him and somehow I think he listened to me he does always and <laughs> I don't know if he's still interested in me because at a point I got really angry <laughs> you know oh angry with God angry with God <laughs> you know I got born again, I was going to redeem. I became the, the parish drummer with my little baby. In fact, the day I had my first child, I went through hell, let me not lie. At a point, I was sleeping in the passage with my, with my child. Okay, so from the time you gave your life to Christ, how easy was it to move on with life? It wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. It was very difficult because, you know, like you were taught, sanctification does not come the moment you get born again. Okay. Sanctification is a gradual process. Okay. When I got born again, and I was still staying in the same, same house with him, and I'll be looking at, this is the man who messed had. me up. <laughs> ah, God. And I was asked to forgive. Can I ever forgive this man? <laughs> ah, well, maybe in the next life. You know, I had to, I, I was trying to pick the piece. I, I couldn't go back to school anyway. When I was in school at the point, I think I lost it. Because everybody stayed away from me, especially Yemi Dabiri. Because we were close. At the point, she stayed away. Because she was like, what's wrong with this girl? Why is she behaving well? Why is she acting like, you know, she stayed away and I was not bothered. 
you know. When I got born again, I was trying to pick the pieces of my life back, see what I can do with my life. It wasn't easy for me. At the point, one of the parishes where I was, in fact, my first parish, I spoke to my pastor, I told him, so I, want, I wanted to go back to school. Because he was working with Waek then. And I saw that as a very big opportunity to go back to school. He kept postponing, kept telling me, okay, we'll talk about it, we'll talk about it, until at the point I said, it's, it's like I'm bothering this man, so let me just stay. You know, I went in my second parish in Redeem. My pastor saw something I was doing. I was, I, I, I do handmade cards. And she looked at me and said, you are gifted. Why don't you go for this training? I said, man, no, no. This is not, this is one of the things I just like doing. I want to learn how to operate the camera. She said, no, go learn screen printing. I said, okay, I don't have a mother. You're old enough to be my mother. If not old enough, they're a big aunt to me. They paid, initially they paid for me to learn how to operate the computer. I went to a computer school. I did all of that. I felt sick. I couldn't complete my course, but I can operate the computer. I went into lens screen printing. When I was done, I showed them my certificate. I said, screen printing. This is my certificate. It's in the house. I'm not using it. Wow. So an opportunity opportunity came up. So Somebody, your certificate is still in the house. It's still now. in the house. Are you planning to use it? As a I don't screen print. I worked for when I was expecting my second child. Because I actually met the father of my second child way back. You know, we lost contact and all that. And then I met again when I was coming home from Holy Ghost service. And somehow, I think my second son was planned. I, I you know, I think I planned my second son, my second child anyway. I said, let me, I just saw his father and I, you know, sweet talk and all of that, nothing. And I said, okay, I want to have another child. And God, if it's a sin, forgive me. But I want to have another child. And please let it be a boy. And he granted my, my request. And he, be, he, he was a boy. He's okay, a boy. It wasn't like he got married to him. No, it was no, just no. There was nothing yeah. like marriage. And that. So, in fact, when I got pregnant of the boy, a lot of things happened. We could not communicate. My phone spoiled. He wasn't around. And eventually, the day I told him, he was mad. And was he married then? He wasn't. But I think he is now. I don't know. So when my, my son came, I saw the boy. I loved him with the whole of my heart. And all of the names I gave him were dropped in my spirit. So I learned screen printing. When I was done, I showed them my certificate. I dropped the certificate. So an opportunity just came up. And somebody said, I know you love this. She gave me the... I just looked at the flyer and I said, wow. I went in to learn how to operate the camera. I just taught the basic things and all of that. Video that I'm doing now, I learned how to operate the video and do video on my uh, I'm still learning anyway I was able to operate the camera initially I take pictures and then I just felt okay the media department they are not much let me switch department because I play the saxophone so when I walked up to my pastor's wife she said okay you can switch departments when the choir is done just move over. back to I said okay you know, that was how I started handling the camera, doing video for the church and all that. I don't get paid anyway, but I have joy doing it. I'm, I'm fine. I'm okay. So, the point where I started getting sanity and I started finding my life was after so many years, after I had my son, after so many years, somehow, myself and Yemi, we just met. And we got talking. It was in the evening. We talked into, like, it's, nine there about and i was telling her and i was telling her things i think she saw that i was bitter that night i didn't even tell her everything i just told her my father destroyed me if you know what that man did and i was close to tears she just said Ayo, don't worry you come and share your story you know she gave me that platform and when i went in when i first shared my story in that program at a point, I realized that the whole hall was tensed, and I saw her crying. And I was going to call her husband, come please, take your wife with me, <laughs> you know. I was sharing the story, it was like I was just telling a normal story, you know. And everybody was like... It was later she told me, hey, girl, 
everybody was like so you've been going through all of this and nobody knew oh no nah. you can't be strong you know and that was how i started getting my sanity i started becoming becoming myself if you see me before you wouldn't want to talk to me you would nah you wouldn't want to talk to me i was looking so shabby I was looking so unkept. Sometimes when I walk and you call me, I'll just, you know, and you just see, see where they see where and I'll keep walking, you know. That was the point where, after the after the storytelling, that that was where I started getting my life. All right. So, after the first program where I first shared my story, Yamida Bear introduced me to some people. And I met some survivors mm. who are doing very well. Mm. One of them is Mrs. Antonia or Jenagma. That woman is <laughs> out of this world. <laughs> you know, she organized a program for survivors. We went. I think the first time I went for that program, I shared a little of my story. And I, I, no, I think the second time I went, I shared my story. She was not around. And then while I was sharing my story, I was just summarizing. And somebody started crying. And I was like, ah, summary, my lady, why are you crying? If you now hear the full story, what will you do? And she stood up and hugged me and said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for what you went through. And I was in my mind, I was like, oh, you watch Apollo, she? You know? And from that time, I've been healing. I'm work in progress. But I think I'm better than what I used to be, you know. Five years ago, before my abuser died, I had looked at him one day. He was carrying one of his grandchildren, and I looked at him, and I said, oh, God, I, had, I wish I had a gun. I would have killed you before you died. You know, I, there was a time I, 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 I boldly challenged him. He said something to me, and I, and I told him, your head not correct. I told him to his face, I said, your head not correct, and I walked away. He was just looking at me, you know. So five years ago when he died, they broke the news, and I was like, oh. and, and, and so, like, <laughs> and so when my daughter heard it, mm. she was like, Mom, what is that? I said, they said your grandfather has died. She was like, oh, my grandfather. I said, will you shut your mouth? <laughs> Emma so couldn't let him you. And she was like, you didn't see. I said, but he saw you. So mm. don't cry in my house. One of his students was staying with me, fainted. You know, and all of that. When he was buried, because the bitterness was still, was still there all the while. When he was sick, I was called upon. You know, like God arranged it. I was broke. I had no money. Mm -hmm. Because I remember twice consecutively, I, I, had, I was working. I sent him money twice. And I was sacked. Mm -hmm. The first time I sent him money, I only, I, I remember I, I took my tight because. I got to know about fighting, and I was like, I would do fighting. Let me see if God will change my life. And if he decides not to do anything for me, I will still try and follow. So do you think he has changed your life up till now? In, in ways I can't explain. explain. Wow, that's you amazing. Know, my being alive today, I owe it to him. Because mm. mother said a whole lot of horrible things to me. Mm. Before she died, even verbal abuse was part exactly. of the whole thing. Because when I look at things that happened to me after the abuse, after before she died and all of that, I have every reason to thank God. Mm. I've had serious. She told me, "If I die, I will come and take you." And I told her, "Uh, -uh. now me won't kill you. <laughs> you can't come and take me." And I remembered immediately she died. The first son, a year after the boy died. Their own first son. Yeah. Died in, in an accident. Wow. Like that, I had a series of accidents that could have claimed lives. Mm. And here I am. Mm. Do I not have a, every reason to thank God? Sure you do. So, my advice to people who are going through abuse, it may not be easy mm. for you to forgive your abuser. Only God knows. It took me like 20-something years of my life mm. 
you know. I think 20 something, 30 something years of my life was taken from me, and it took me a whole lot. And uh, it wasn't easy for me to forgive him, but I thank God that eventually I was able to forgive him. And things I couldn't do, I just realized that I could do them. You know, my advice to people who are going through abuse, it may not be easy, but eventually you will, you will scale through with the help of God. If God can help a broken ayok, in fact, a bent ayok, to be straightened, He can do much more for you. Mm. He still hears her. I remember when I told God, stay in heaven. <laughs> Rule your kingdom. <laughs> Let me stay here. And I, I made an article. I know I can't sing now after I've mm. done the song. And here I am. He's faithful. He's loving. He has not forgotten me. And has not, I won't tell you that no matter what you're going through, I know God is there. He's always right bef beside us. When you call him, in the sincerity of your heart, he will answer. All right, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you very much. And to all our viewers, that was a story. That was a story. And I'm sure that everything she said, you understood. There is nothing you are going through in life that God cannot save you from. Everything you have been through, somebody had gone through it. You might not have even met the person yet. And everything that you're struggling with, someone had come out of it. Thank you very much for coming on this show. Pleasure, ma'am. We'll be right back. World Foundation Show. From experience to encounter. Okay. On behalf of World Foundation Show, we have this for you. Thank you for coming on the show. And then we are saying... Thank you. I like it. <laughs> I like it. Thank you very much for coming on the show. <laughs> all right, to all our viewers at home, this is where we come to the end of this episode. Remember, if you have a story to tell us on this show, feel free to contact us on our numbers on your screen. And also, you can send us an email on our email on your screen. And you can also check us out on our social media platforms, World Foundation, on Facebook, on Instagram, and on Twitter. Check out our partners page. You want to partner with us to keep this show going, or you want to sponsor a part of this show. We'll be glad to hear from you. Till we come your way again next time, have a beautiful time. Remember, your purpose is in your pain. Bye-bye.